Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this lecture, we're going to look at animal development. So this is really part of chapter 36 that we didn't get to with when we looked at sexual reproduction in animals and that. And what we're going to focus in on today is development. I think this is kind of a crucial thing that happens. And what's interesting is that really all animals share very similar types of development. What happens is you get fertilization, you get this uh, division of cells with uh, maintaining the size of the egg cell uh, called cleavage. And then finally, you get this thing called a blastula, which is a ball of cells. And then finally, a gastrula, which is the ball of cells where now you have this kind of indentation, which is in lower invertebrates, the start of the mouth, and in uh, larger vertebrates in that, in most vertebrate animals, well, all vertebrate animals, is called the anus. And so we'll look at that, and that's the difference between a protostome and a deuterostome when we look at that. But really, all animals at the very early stages of development develop the same way. And I have this picture here just to show you what everything looks like. And so when we look at the chordates, chordates develop very similarly. And you can see that it's very hard to tell the difference between each one. There's some similarities and some differences. But again, the main thing is, is that we develop very similar in the, in the, in the same way. We kind of start with the, the nervous system. The nervous system lays out to the rest of the tissues and development. And eventually, by the three weeks of development, you start to see some major differences in the animals as we go along. And you can kind of start to see them turning into what they should be as babies in that when we look at these different things. And so it's really interesting to see, though, that very early on, most of the development is very similar. So you see the presence of the notochord, which is turns into the vertebrae in all these animals. You see a tail. You see these pharyngeal pouches on all of these. You see the development of the eye spot. You can even see the spinal cord in the brain even starting to develop in these early stages and then what becomes the eyes and then the other features of the limbs and everything else. And so you can see that there's a very uh, similar way of development, whether you're talking about a shark, a pig, or a human in these situations. And that's one of the reasons why um, we can see evolutionarily that development really hasn't changed that much over time. Now, what they turn into could be different between wings and limbs and arms and legs and all those things. But really, the pattern of development is pretty much the same. And so we're going to explain this and go through this today and take a quick look at how development actually takes place. So again, let's take a look. So first, we'll look at how does fertilization takes, takes place. And so we'll look at the process of fertilization, what happens when the sperm uh, binds with the egg cell, and then what prevents other sperm from binding and causing polyspermia, as it's called, from causing that to occur. So how does how does the egg stop that from happening? So we'll look at that. Then we'll go through the stages of animal development. So we'll start early with the, again, the zygote, and then work our way through what is called cleavage. And cleavage is a special type of division, cell division, where you basically have cell division with no growth. So the cell doesn't really get any bigger. So the blastula ends up being about the same size as the egg cell, even though you have 10 times as many cells, or probably even more than 100 times as many cells than you do in the egg cell. So the egg cell is one cell, and then you get into the blastula, which is hundreds, if not thousands of cells into a ball of cells, but they all are about the same size. And that's what we call cleavage. So we'll go through that and talk about the different stages there. And then we'll look at how humans compare to other animals. We'll talk about the stages of development. And like I showed you in that previous picture, it's very similar. And then Really, most of the development takes place in the first eight weeks, and then it's just about growth after that. And so we'll look at that, and then we'll go through the different phases of pregnancy. In humans, we have a 38-week gestation period, so 38 to 39 weeks, depending on how long, and that, and that's a lot of times based on the last period. So when the mother has their last period, that's where we count the dates till, till pregnancy and that, and that's kind of how they estimate uh, when the due date would be and all those other things uh, based on the the mother's last uh, menstruation period. And then from there we go on to what would the pregnancy be. Now, um, again, we'll talk about where does the embryo implant, when does fertilization take place going through the different stages. And then looking at human pregnancy, we divide everything up in three months because it's pretty much a nine month cycle. And so we have three uh, sets of terms or trimesters that we look at. And we'll talk about what takes place in the different things. 
Really, most of the development of all the organs and everything else takes place in the first trimester. Then the second and third is all about growing. And so we go from the size of a little pea all the way up to a big baby. So, you know, and we've seen some of these things where babies can be up to 10, 12, 15 pounds, which are really big babies, but typically about an average between six and 10 pounds once the baby is born. That's the average. Uh, and again, probably eight pounds is probably the average there, and that's a little bit heavy on that side in that. So anything less we kind of think of as maybe even being premature and that stuff. So we'll look at that and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on uh, looking at pregnancy and that. Okay, so that's where we're headed today looking at animal development. And so again, fertilization, cleavage, and gastrulation initiate embryonic development. So whether we're talking about frogs, starfish, uh, humans, that all pretty much takes place the same way in the early development. And then you have organogenesis, which is the big step where you start developing the organs. So we'll look at that here in a second. So the first thing that happens is fertilization. That's where the sperm and egg come together and you form a diploid zygote. The zygote is one cell, okay, with the full number of chromosomes. And then you get this division with no growth. So if you see the zygote is the same size as this ball of cells. And this one is about... I would say this is probably a 16 stage, maybe a 32 stage cell. And again, the, the size of the cell, the overall number of cells is changed, but the overall size has not. And that's called cleavage. Then what happens is then you form this ball of cells called a blastula. And a blastula, again, is a hollow ball of cells. Now in this one, you see that you have these cells on the inside and that's getting ready to form the yolk sac and everything else. Then you get this gastrulization, which is kind of this, if you think of like a tennis ball that is deflated and you can push it in, that's what happens during gastrulation. And so gastrulation is kind of that start of that pushing in process. And so that's what happens with that ball of cells is you have this big hollow ball and then all of a sudden you start pushing it in like a deflated tennis ball in that case and you can push in and that's gastrulization. And again, depending on the type of animal, that means you're either forming your mouth or your anus. Uh, depending on if it's a protostome or a deuterostome in that. Then you get organogenesis where you form the three layers of tissues and we'll talk about the different layers and what they resolve into. And then finally you get into the larval stages and then with the frog it goes through metamorphosis where the larval stage loses its tail and then you become an adult frog. Now not in all organisms do you have metamorphosis obviously in that and so we'll kind of go to organogenesis, talk about pregnancy and then leave it from there. And then, you know, then we get into adults. And again, different animals have different stages once they're born and that, but we'll look at that as well. Okay, so that's what we're looking at today. So fertilization. So again, with fertilization, that's when the sperm actually penetrates the egg. And what happens in this process is that then you have, uh, again, the release of the genetics or the sperm head, which gets into the egg cell right here. Uh, you can see that there's the polar body still attached to the egg cell, and that gets ejected once you have fertilization. So this polar body gets reabsorbed and ejected out, and then the sperm head itself goes in and then meets up with the chromosomes of the, of the egg cell. Okay, Once this happens, once this penetration happens, and I'll show you in the next couple of slides, Basically, there's a uh, essentially a signal that says, okay, no more sperm are allowed in, and this jelly ring around it, so these cells that are around this, the zona pellucida, actually hardens up and prevents sperm from attaching, and it releases all any other sperm that's attached to the egg that hasn't penetrated the egg yet. And so what that does is it essentially avoids polyspermy from actually happening. So we'll go through the steps here in a few minutes uh, more specifically, but what happens is, again, the sperm has this head that has these uh, enzymes that allow it to work its way through the uh, spaces in the zona pellucida and the cumulus cells. Once it gets through, it actually binds to the egg, and then you have fusion of the sperm head with the egg cell. And so once that happens, there's a signal that's sent out, and it causes that jelly layer, jelly layer to harden, and you lose the receptors, and so no other sperm can bind, and so that avoids... Uh, the polyspermy. And we'll show you this here in just a second as we go through. So this is the this is the moment where the sperm comes in. Okay, so the sperm head, this is the chromosomes right here in the sperm head, okay, or in that in that part, you have the jelly coat around the eggs and you have these receptors that allow for the sperm to bind. Now you see this little acrosome, this is containing digestive enzymes that are going to eat its way through the jelly layer and get itself positioned so it can bind with these sperm binding receptors. So the next step 
is that you have these enzymes released. So once the sperm gets in there and you can see it breaks down that jelly layer and it's working its way towards the, the sperm receptors. Now the other thing that it has is these actin filaments which are gonna help attach it. It's kind of like these cables or lifelines that help it attach to the egg. Once it has this layer, this vitreon layer exposed that it can attach to and that's the next step. So once it's exposed, you have this acrosomal process that comes out with these receptors that allow it to bind to these receptors on the egg cell. So now the sperm is attached and once that sperm has attached, it's kind of like making a contact with the egg. It enters into the egg and then you have this fusion of the plasma membrane. So again, you have this breakdown of the jelly layer around it. You have this attachment once the acrosomal attaches and now it can kind of pull itself forward. So it uses this to kind of pull in. You get the fusion of the plasma membrane and now the sperm head containing the chromosomes can now enter into the egg. And so this happens, you get this release of these cortical granules which will harden the jelly. It will also cause a release of these uh, sperm receptors. So that's the other thing that happens is you release these sperm receptors so that other sperm cannot attach to the egg. So not only do you harden this jelly so that the sperm can't get in, but it also uh, basically releases these receptors so that the sperm, if they even made it through this layer, cannot attach to the egg. And so you lose these sperm receptors. And so these acrosomal processes cannot attach to the egg itself. So once this gets in and you have this plasma fusion, uh, no longer can this happen. And you can see that you gain this, uh, what is called the perivitaline uh, uh, space, which basically occurs from the attachment and this uh, again, the um, when we look at this, the vitrillin uh, layer gets uh, pushed away from the egg. And so this is all this process to prevent polysperm from happening. Okay, so essentially this is the process of what happens during fertilization. You get the binding of the sperm after it works its way through the jelly layer, it binds to these receptors. You get a fusion of the plasma membranes. And then once that fusion happens, it sends a signal to the egg cells to release the sperm receptor receptors on the egg as well as the vitrillin layer separates out and prevents anything, any other sperm from fertilizing the egg. And so that's, and that would be called polyspermy if you get more than one sperm fertilizing the egg, which would be bad news because then you get multiple chromosomes in there and that's not a good thing. Now, once fertilization takes place, like I said, the metabolic reactions re, uh, trigger the embryonic development thus activating the egg. It releases calcium ions, which activates the egg and triggers the cortical reactions, which blocks the polyspermy. So this is that happening down here. So if we take a look, same process, the sperm heads you get, you get an introduction of water. Then you have this separation of the fertilization membrane from the egg itself. The vitrillin layer pulls away. And now you have that vitrillin space, the paravitrillin space, uh, which occurs once you have this introduction. Now the sperm nucleus is going to work its way towards the egg nucleus so that they're going to combine and form the 46 chromosomes if we're talking about humans. And again, just to show you what happens is once you have sperm attaching, this sperm attaches first, this cortical granule releases, it causes a hardening of the jelly coat as well as the release of these uh, sperm receptors. And so it prevents any attachment from any other sperm trying to get in. And so when that doesn't happen, you avoid polyspermy. So it's a nice reaction to occur. So the first sperm that gets there and gets through the jelly layer and attaches is going to be the winner. The rest of the sperm are denied from getting in. And again, that's due to the activation of the egg and what happens in that place. Now, once you have fertilization, so you can see here's a fertilized egg, you start to begin this process called cleavage. And cleavage is a rapid cell division in which the cell divides, but you can see that it maintains the same size. And so that the cell, this uh, fertilized egg, which is now called a zygote, now becomes four cells, and then it becomes multiple, probably 32 cells here, and then eventually turns into a blastula. But what you can see is that the size does not change. The number of cells changes, but the size do not. And so this is a rapid cell division with no growth. And that is what is described as cleavage. And again, it goes through many stages. And so every time you divide a cell, it goes from two cells to four, to eight, to 16, to 32, to 64, and then, and then, and then, and going on and on and on. What you see is that you develop from a ball of cells to now a hollow ball of cells, which is called the blastula. And the blastula has this fluid-filled cavity called the blastocele. 
And again, the blastulus produced about uh, five to seven cleavage divisions. So anywhere from 64 cells to 128 cells do you form this blastula. And again, what you're looking at is it's not just a ring of cells, but it's a whole ball of cells. So what you're kind of doing is looking through these cells and you're looking into the inside. So think of this as a big ball of cells, not just kind of a ring of cells that's going on there. Because what you're doing is seeing inside of these cells itself. Okay, and then after cleavage, the rate of cell division slows, and now what you're starting to get is this morphogenesis. So you have this, uh, again, blastula. You start to see this development of different types of tissues. So the top part is going to be what is known as the ectoderm. That's going to form the nervous system. You have these inner cells, which are the red cells here, again, are, are labeled red. And those are the mesoderm. Those are going to develop into a lot of the intermediate tissues in that inside. And then what you have is the vegetal pole, which is going to be the yolky cells or the endoderm. And this turns into the basically the digestive cavity. So then what you see is during blastula, the first thing that happens is you start to see this pushing in what is called the blastopore. So this is where the cells start to invaginate in and it starts to work its way in. Once this starts to happen, this is where, again, you have either development of the mouth or the anus, depending on what type of animal. And see that it takes place in the endoderm, because that's essentially what happens, is the endoderm is going to form a tube inside of a tube. And that's what we see. And so then after you have this early invagination, you start to build a little bit more of an inter- uh, push and so again you have this push in here this is the digestive tube here coming in this is now called the arc enteron because again it's forming the digestive cavity and then you see this push where the arc enteron enters into the space it gets bigger and then the blastocele is getting kind of pushed out and so you see kind of how it's rotating around and so now you have the three layers you have the ectoderm on the outside you have the mesoderm and then the endoderm this is forming the digestive cavity and eventually these will all form together. And so in a vertebrate, this is forming the anus. And eventually once this comes all the way through, you'll form the mouth and then you'll have this uh, interaction taking place. Okay, so that's what's going on here. And so once it starts this pushing, we now call this a gastrula. So again, it pushes in and you form a gastrula, what's happening here in this position. Okay, so just kind of showing you again, from what's happening. So the vegetal pole flattens. So that's how you know the difference. So you have the animal pole and the vegetal pole. This is what's going to basically feed the feed the, feed the cells during the development. And then you have that blastopore. The blastopore pushes in. This is going to be, again, depending on the animal, either the mouth or the anus. And you can see it pushing in. You can see the mesoderm cells on the inside here. Eventually, these will form the endoderm, where again, the arc interon, which is this part, what is called, again, is forming the gastro cavity in this case. And then you have this development. Now, the blastopore here is going to form the anus, and then eventually it will form the mouth once the uh, opening is ready to uh, form. But again, now you form your three layers. And then once this arc interon meets the ectoderm up here, this is where the mouth is going to form. And so this is in starfish development. And so again, starfish are deuterostomes, so they form the anus first and the mouth second. And so all vertebrate animals do the same thing, where the anus is formed first and then the mouth is second. This layer of tissue will be the endoderm, which, I, like I said, will form the digestive cavity. Oops, let me go back here digestive cavity. This will form the mesoderm, which is the muscular and inner tissues. And then the ectoderm forms the neuro tissues and the skin of the organism itself. And so we'll look at that here. And so again, depending on the type of animal, you'll either have two or three layers. And again, the only difference between the jellyfish and all the other animals above it is that there isn't any mesoderm that forms. You just have the ectoderm and the endoderm, and then everything else forms the mesoderm, which is the cells on the inside. So we'll talk about that here in a second. So that's called gastrulation. So this forming of this arc interon, the pushing in of the cells, and once that pushes in, you get what is called the arc interon, which again forms the digestive cavity. And then you have the blaster seal on each side. That's the essentially going to be the coelom, this uh, the cavity spaces, and then you have the tissues around it. Now, like I mentioned before, those cell layers produced by gastrulation is called the germ layers. And then those germ layers form into the different layers. We're going to talk about what these things do. Now, again, in the uh, 
the ectoderm forms the nerves and skin, the mesoderm forms the middle tissues, and then the endoderm forms the digestive cavity. And so again, we'll talk about these things here in just a second. But you can kind of see with the development of the archaneuron, this guy forms their mouth, and so now you have a complete digestive system in this face. The digestive tube, you have the cells on the inside, which are going to be the mesoderm, and then the ectoderm on the outside. So again, kind of gives you an idea of what's forming in these situations. Now, as I've mentioned before and a number of times, the difference between the protostome and the deuterostome is what forms first. So in the protostome, the mouth forms first. So the blastopore will form the mouth and then the anus second. So this is why it, with the protostome, sometimes you don't have a complete digestive system because sometimes the anus doesn't get formed, especially in those things like the planaria or the... Um, jellyfish they don't have an anus because they have an incomplete because the mouth forms first and this arc enteron never reaches the other side whereas with the deuterostome since you form the anus first you're always going to have a complete digestive system because you have to form the mouth second and so that's one of the advantages of forming the mouth second is that you're always going to guarantee yourself having two openings to your digestive system and again anything that's a deuterostome is anything above a starfish and all vertebrates are going to be deuterostomes. So they form their anus second, mouth, or I'm sorry, anus first, mouth is second. Okay, and again, it's the same thing. That arc around pushes its way through, and then you form the mouth, and then you can see the different layers of the tissues. Now, what forms during that point? So once we get the gastrulation done, we now go through this process called organogenesis, which is essentially the development of the organs, and that forms from the different layers of tissue that come out of that development. So the first thing that forms is the ectoderm, which is the outer layer. And again, you can see what it forms. Essentially, it forms the epidermis of the skin and its derivatives, including sweat glands, hair follicles, forms all the nervous system. So again, in sensory systems, so spinal cord, nerves, brain, all that other good stuff comes from there. Forms the pituitary gland, the adrenal medulla, again, the jaws and the teeth, and then the germ cells that form all those different layers. So the neurons and all those other good things that are there. The mesoderm forms the skeletal and muscle systems, the circulatory lymphatic systems, the excretory and reproductive systems, except the germ cells, which come from the ectoderm, the dermis of the skin, and the adrenal cortex. And so again, these form kind of the middle layers of everything, including the blood in these organisms. And then finally, the endoderm forms the digestive tract. And then anything from there, sometimes you get the epithelial lining of the respiratory, excretory, and reproductive tracts thymus, thyroid, and parathyroid glands, but primarily the digestive tract and the associated organs, the liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder, all those different things that we associate with the endoderm. So ectoderm, skin and nerves, mesoderm, muscles and bone, and endoderm is going to be the uh, nervous system, or I'm not nervous system, digestive system. Okay, and so that's what you can for, uh, come from there. Germ cells, and I've just thought of this now, germ cells are the reproductive cells. So that's going to be the sperm or egg, depending on the genetics, the X and Y, and again, male versus female in these situations. Now in humans, again, conception and fertilization takes place. So what happens is during the time of ovulation, the egg is released. Fertilization actually takes place inside the fallopian tube. And so this fertilization takes place out here. The zygote will then move its way down and then you have the start of cleavage. So as it's working, there's little cilia in the fallopian tube that are helping push the egg down. Now, sometimes the egg can actually get implanted in the fallopian tube. And that's what we call a tubal pregnancy, where if this guy doesn't make it all the way out and it actually implants itself inside the fallopian tube. And again, that pregnancy probably will not have a chance to survive because what happens is, is obviously it will get too large for this tube and it could damage, again, the tube as well as uh, cause problems with uh, the mother uh, having um, where the tube will maybe um, break and that and cause some, some serious problems in that, in that situation. And so typically what they'll have to do is remove the egg from the tube and uh, unfortunately the pregnancy will not resolve. What should normally happen is once you have cleavage, and so you go from the zygote to the two cell stage and you work your way down, is that that blastula will make it into the uterus. So this is about day three, and then you get implantation, which is about day five to day six. And when you have that implantation in the uterus, into the endometrium, you get this implantation of the blastula going into almost gastrulation. And so that's where you have that. 
And so again, once that occurs, you now have the rapid development of the embryo. So really, the just to kind of give you an idea of the development, once you have fertilization, that is called the zygote. As soon as you start cleavage, you could call it cleavage in the process, but now this becomes an embryo. So once that division of the egg cell happens, it no longer is a zygote, it's now called an embryo. And that's, that uh, organism or embryo is called an embryo until about eight weeks. And then we call that a fetus for the rest of the development. And we'll look at that here in a few minutes. But essentially this is what happens. The early stages work its way down the fallopian tube and then you get implement in, implantation at, like I said, about day five or day six when it's now in the blastula uh, gastrula stage here. Okay, now again, gestation in humans is about 38 weeks, and then it varies among the different mammals, anywhere from 21 days in rodents to more than 600 days in elephants. So I guess we might as well be glad that we're not elephants in that and how long we carry pregnancy. Now, in human gestation, it is uh, divided into three trimesters, about three months each, and you can kind of see how large the organism or the, I should say, the fetus will get during that time. And so again, three months, it's very uh, little growth that goes on in this case, but the, the remaining months, you see a very large growth in how large the, the, fetus, or the fetus actually gets. And so by month nine, the baby is very large and actually pushing up the organs uh, on mom. So she's ready to uh, get rid of this child because it is uh, very heavy on the organs and then especially pushing on these things. And so again, the other thing that the fetus does is it kind of pushes on the bladder. And so it does force mom to have to pee a lot because again, the baby's sitting on the bladder. And so just having that urge of always having to pee and that stuff is just due to the size of the baby. So again, pregnancy is a wonderful thing and that stuff not telling, telling people that it don't get pregnant, but again, it does impact the mom in a way, but we as humans were designed to handle this. And so that is, that's one of the things just showing you what happens in these situations of what goes on. Now, during the first trimester, again, the embryo secretes hormones that signal the presence and the regulate the reproductive system. And the big one is this human karyonic curio, uh, gonadotropin or HCG. This is what we monitor to see to make sure that the pregnancy is moving along uh, very well. During the time of development, this HCG number should increase every couple of days, and so it should double. And so this is what the doctor's tracking to make sure that the normal pregnancy is following by normal. So every week, I believe it's supposed to double so many, so many numbers. And again, I don't remember what the exact uh, doubling time is, but that's what they look for. So they look for a healthy pregnancy. They measure the HCG rates in the blood to make sure that pregnancy is occurring normally and that everything's happening. What you can see is that it starts off very slowly, okay? So you get this development, actually it's very fast. And so it starts off kind of looking like a very a, a kind of alien looking structure within five to seven weeks. So you go from week five that looks just like a, a long tube or kind of like a fish into what is uh, looks like kind of this alien baby to what almost looks like a normal baby about week nine. And so really all the development of the organs and all the other parts of the baby take place within the first eight weeks. And so you can see the earlobe develops, the eyes develop, and then finally the basic facial features are in place by week 13. And so again, what happens after about the first 12 weeks of pregnancy is just growth. And so all the things are formed. You can see all the limbs are formed, all the legs are formed, all the eyes, the nose, the ears, the mouth are all formed in this situation. What happens after this stage is development into the regular baby and getting to the normal size. And so that's what happens during that time. Now, sometimes what happens is you actually get the development of twins. And so this can happen either where you have an, one egg and one sperm. And what happens is that the, the uh, again, the embryo will divide early to form two embryos. And so that would be the case of identical twins. And so they share the same DNA everything is alike. And again, the children will look exactly alike because they're identical because they have the same genetic makeup. So identical twins are always going to be the same sex. They're always going to look very similar and they're going to share the same DNA. And so that's very, very common. And so uh, with that, when you have this, and so again, one egg, one sperm, and you get this early separation. Now, sometimes women will ovulate twice 
uh, during their ovulation cycle. So they'll release two eggs. And if that happens, this is when you get fraternal twins. And fraternal twins, you can have separate sexes because it's two different genetic makeups. And so these guys, even though they're twins, may not look alike because, again, they have two sets of genetic uh, variances that take place. So you can have boy and girl, you can have, again, same sex if, if that's the case, or um, again, you can have very different looking kids and those things and still be twins. And so that is the idea of uh, these types of things. Now, sometimes what will happen is that if genetic abnormalities or chromosomal abnorm abnormalities will happen, sometimes what will take place is a spontaneous abortion. And so this is a lot of times that happens within the first 12 weeks. And so that's one of the reasons why um, that uh, doctors will say, do not announce that you're pregnant before 12 weeks, because a lot of times you have genetic issues that during this course of development that things don't end up right. And then the, the mother will lose the, lose the baby right away. And so a lot of times mom doesn't even know she's pregnant at the time, especially if she has a very irregular cycle. And so this is how sometimes we don't even know that we we're pregnant and, and those things happen. And so again, that can happen very often and that can be due to the genetic abnormalities. What they say is that the average is if you make it to 12 weeks and pregnancy looks good, is that you have a 75% chance of making it through the term of pregnancy once you go through through that. So you have a very good chance of making it through all the way through pregnancy if you get through the first 12 weeks. And so then they say after 12 weeks, it's fine to announce because your the likelihood of making it through and having a baby is going to be very, very, very uh, likely. The likelihood is going to be very good. And those chances and so that's one of those things so that that's the other thing that can happen but i just wanted to show you what happens in the difference between twins and so identical same egg and sperm what happens is the embryo divides and you have two separate embryos that form and you can see two separate amniotic sacs but they share the same placenta in fraternal twins you have two separate placentas so they uh, typically what will happen is that they will embed in different spots of the uterus and again you have two genetically different organisms because again you have two separate eggs and two separate sperms and so that's what happens there and so again that's the difference between identical twins and fraternal twins so if you do have more questions about that please ask and we'll, we'll definitely talk about that in class and that stuff but that's the idea between those two now during development, again, during the first two or four weeks, the embryo obtains the nutrients uh, from the endoderm. Once it gets in there and the trophoblast takes place, it mingles with the endometrium and eventually forms the placenta. So you can see the blastocyst kind of feeds itself. Once it gets implanted in the cells, you start to see this development of the placenta. And the placenta is, again, the growth of the cells into the endometrium. Once you get into this endometrium, it starts to uh, share, and you can kind of see this uh, um, invagination of the placenta. And again, the more foldings allows for more exchange of oxygen and food. And so this placenta becomes very enriched with blood and nutrients for the baby to grow and develop. And obviously, as the baby gets larger and more oxygen is required, you see a very large uh, exchange of gases as well as for nutrients as well. And so again, what this allows for the embryo to do is, again, supply nutrients, immune protection, so antibodies can come across and metabolic waste disposal from the baby itself. Okay, so everything is done there. But the biggest thing is gas exchange, nutrient exchange, and then waste exchange between mom and baby. And that is through the placenta that takes place. And you can see early on, it's all by the egg. And then eventually what you have is development of this placenta and you get this invagination and again this, this sprawling uh, um, growth of the placenta so you get more surface area and more division to exchange those nutrients now the first trimester is the main period of organogenesis within five to eight weeks this all the embryo develops all the organs and everything else and so a lot of times women don't even know and so the damage could be done and so a lot of birth defects can happen very early and not even known because the mother doesn't even know she's pregnant especially if she has a, a very in um, invariable period cycle or menstruation cycle so she may not know that she's pregnant and if she was drinking or smoking or doing drugs at that time it can have a serious effect on the development and so once once about 12 weeks happens that first trimester happens 
really uh, everything is developed and now the fetus is just growing. So really you can see by 14 weeks, which is pretty much the end of that first trimester, you now have the fully functioning baby, you have all the organs developed, and now it's just a period of growth. So after really that first trimester, everything that goes on is growth with inside that fetus. And so like I said, you go from an embryo to a fetus after eight weeks, because again, all the major stru uh, structures are, are there, all the organs are there, and now it's just about the time of growth and getting bigger for the baby itself. Again, during the second trimester, the fetus grows and is very active. The mother may feel some of the movements. And again, that's when you start to feel the baby kicking and moving around, especially about, about after the week, uh, week 18, because the baby starts to move inside the placenta. You can see the development of the umbilical cord. And again, you start to see hair growing, development of fat on the baby, and then the baby's eyes open within the first 20 weeks of growth. And so again, and then baby can kind of sense what's going on around them and then re realizes hands and other things uh, at the time. And you may actually, after about 20 weeks, see the baby sucking its thumb and doing some other things inside the, inside the amniotic fluid. Okay, and then finally, as the fetus grows in the third uh, trimester, again, again, it's just about getting bigger until about week 36 to week 40. The only thing I'll mention here about this is that about week 36 is when the lungs start to really develop and, and get large. And so that's because the lungs aren't necessary at that time. And so the lungs are not really formed. So the big thing that we talk about is, especially if the baby comes early premature before the uh, 32nd week, it becomes an issue with breathing because the lungs aren't fully formed. And so really that's the problem and that's the biggest issue is that baby can't breathe very well it's on its own and that's one of the reasons why if it's a premature baby it has risk of having breathing issues because the lungs aren't fully developed at that time so really the only thing that doesn't develop within that first eight weeks is the lungs now you do have uh, very small lungs and again you may be able to breathe at that time but it's not fully functional until you get to about week 36 once the surfactants and that open up the lungs and get them ready to go. And then by the time the baby is born, the lungs are fully functional and ready to go on that. And so, like I said, anything before week 32, you really run the risk of, again, premature with the preemies and that stuff is breathing issues because the lungs aren't fully formed at that time. Okay, so then the last thing is with the uh, human development is, again, childbirth. And that goes along with labor, which is a series of strong rhythmic contractions that push the fetus out of the body. And again, there's uh, regulators, prostaglandins, and hormones that induce and further contractions of the uterus. You can see there's a couple of different stages of uh, delivery. Again, the first thing is the breaking of the uh, amniotic sac, which is the water breaking. Once that water breaks, Again, that's the signal of pregnancy, or again, of uh, delivery, because essentially that water breaks, that's the amniotic fluid, and then the cervix opens up and dilates for the, the head to be out first. And so that's the normal uh, position for delivery. Now, sometimes what happens is that the butt come out, can come out first, or the legs can come out first, and that is called a breach. And so again, you have to be very careful because the baby can get stuck. And so if that happens, they may have to do an emergency C-section in that case because the baby can't get out the right way. And so you don't want to get the baby stuck. And again, especially with breathing and all those other things, especially if the placenta becomes unattached at this point, because that can be another issue as well, because then baby can't exchange the nutrients. And so that's the other thing that we look at. So essentially what happens is that the first stage is the active phase where you have the water breaking and again, dilation of the cervix, cervix and again, the head reaching the uh, point of the cervix. Now stage two is when the head does make it out of the vagina and you have the crowning and then, and then delivery of the baby. And then finally stage three is when the placenta is actually delivered. So the placenta will remove itself from the uterus and the remaining tissue will come out uh, of that part. So again, stage one is kind of the pre-delivery, stage two is delivery of the baby, and then stage three is delivery of the placenta, which is the second part of delivery after the baby is born. And so again, happens pretty quickly uh, in that, but it's just where the placenta detaches from the uterus and then it's delivered through, again, the cervix and the vagina uh, after delivery of the baby. Okay, so that's what happens there. 
Now, the last thing I'll mention is lactation. So again, during human development, mother uh, uh, hormones will trigger the mammary glands to start producing milk. And again, the secretion of the oxytocin along with the other uh, hormone, which I can't remember uh, at this time, essentially causes the uh, milk to um, be formed. Now, this is a uh, a positive feedback loop because once baby starts to suckle, that will also uh, send uh, uh, release of the oxytocin. So that is a primary or a positive feedback where again, the stimulation of the nerves will cause the response in the hypothalamus to release oxytocin, which will cause the release of prolactin. That's what I was looking for. And this all stimulates the release of milk from the uh, the mammary glands. And so the prolactin stimulates additional milk production and again allows for breastfeeding to take place. Now sometimes women will not have enough uh, milk to produce in that and so the baby may have to go on formula right away or sometimes that they will even recommend is that they use kind of a uh, milk from a surrogate. So again a lot of times some women overproduce milk and so uh, or if they stop breastfeeding uh, at that time, what will happen is they produce enough breast milk that they can store it for mothers that don't produce enough. And so you can kind of use that because they do say breast milk is the best in the sense that one, it provides essential nutrients, but it also provides protection for the immune system. So when we talked about the immune system, one of the benefits of breastfeeding is the is the passive immunity of the antibodies that mom produces to the baby. And so that's one of the other things that breast milk does that formula doesn't give all the time. And so that's one of the reasons why they do say breast milk is best in these situations. Okay, so again, positive feedback. And then when mom stops breastfeeding, that signal goes away. And so the production of the mammary glands will stop and then again, revert back to uh, normal stages. Okay, and so that is getting to the end of our uh, discussion about uh, deli or delivery, the discussion about development and the, the pregnancy in a human and, and those types of things. So again, we talked about the development of the egg into the mature embryo, which requires the fertilization. We talked about the stages of fertilization, the sperm entering in, using the enzymes to work its way through the jelly layer, binding to the egg, through the actin acrosome binding to the receptors. Once you have the plasma membranes fused and the release of the nucleus into the egg cell, you then cause the uh, vitrillin layer to separate off and then the jelly layer to harden to prevent polyspermy. So that was what's going on with fertilization. Again, the two combine the pronucleus of the egg and the pronucleus of the sperm combine to form the nucleus and then you have fertilization which forms the zygote. Once you have the zygote form, you then go in through rapid uh, division without growth. That is called cleavage. And again, you go through the multiple stages of cleavage from the two cell to four to eight to 16 to 32 and so on and so forth. You develop into a blastula, which is a hollow ball of cells. And then finally into a gastrula, which is that pushing in of the cells, which forms the archeneron, which ends up being the digestive cavity. And so again, in protostomes that forms the mouth, in deuterostomes that forms the anus and eventually you form the other end which forms the mouth which is the deuterostome or the mouth again which forms in the deuterostomes. Once you have gastrulation then you have organogenesis which forms the three germ layers which is the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. The ectoderm is the nerves and the skin. The mesoderm is the muscles and the blood and the bones and the endoderm is the digestive system and the associated organs. Once you have all those things into those uh, tissues, you start to do what is major organogenesis, developing all the organs. Like I said, all the major organs develop within eight weeks of pregnancies in humans. Uh, when that happens, a lot of times mothers don't even know they're pregnant at that time. So again, that's where you can have some issues. We talked about what happens, the difference between fraternal and uh, paternal, or paternal and identical, or fraternal or identical twins. Fraternal is when you have two eggs that are two embryos in that case that have been fertilized that implant and then identical is where the embryo splits early on in cell division into two separate embryos and forms identical twins. And again, the difference is same genetics with identical twins, whereas with fraternal twins, you have two different embryos with two different types of genetics going on in those situations. After eight weeks, we then be, call the embryo fetus. That feto, fetus then, most of the organs, like I said, are formed goes through large stages of growth. So really the last 
uh, last 24 to 26 weeks of pregnancy are all about growth of the baby. All the organs are formed, uh, and then you go through the stages of delivery, water breaks, uh, and then you go through the process delivery where the baby is delivered, the placenta is delivered, and then you have, like we talked about, lactation at the very end due to the hormone stimulation of the mammary glands. And so with that, we talked a little bit about the delivery. We've gone through the process of development and all that other good stuff. If you do have any questions, please let me know. Uh, we can go through more of the stages and talk about uh, specifics. In lab, we're going to look at, again, starfish development and frog development, looking at the difference between early cleavage and late cleavage, blastulas and gastrulas, and looking at all that, and then talk a little bit about the tissue development that comes from there. But if you have any questions between now and then and you watch this video, uh, please ask. I'll be happy to answer them for you as we go along. So I thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.